What are the signs of the times? Two kingdoms are at war. We are in a clash of dynasties. The headlines today seem to indicate that evil forces and the power of darkness are prevailing in the last days against the kingdom of light. The signs are wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters and man-made calamities. Will we be the generation to witness his coming, to witness both a great awakening and a falling away from the faith? How do we fight for the kingdom of light? How do we know how it ends? Let's look at the headlines. Also add happy Mother's Day to, uh, to all of you. And um, I was talking to my mom yesterday, and I'm not sure, uh, I thought she was going to watch last night. She said if she didn't have anything better to do, uh, she'd try to take it in. But uh, I'm not sure that she did because I picked at her a little bit, and normally I'd, I'd hear from her. But so maybe she's watching today, and if that's the case, happy Mother's Day, Mom. So uh, a lot of our Mother's Days through the years have been just like this, her on the other end of a telephone somewhere. But uh, last year she was here because we, on Mother's Day, had, uh, I'd call it like a soft opening or kind of our workers' dedication here in the building. Uh, there was no carpet. There was a scissor jack over here in the corner and all that. But what a, what a great service uh, just to be here uh, many of you were here for that and then later for our, our dedication and so forth. But uh, my mom w was here and that was a great blessing to me uh, to have her here. So if you've got mom with you, that's a great blessing. And uh, uh, keep, keep up uh, all that love that you need to have uh, for one another uh, during that time. You know, you get older, uh, a lot of our conversations, I'll call mom. We were talking some, uh, some weeks ago and... In, in, uh, she was telling me about everybody. Uh, she's, she still lives in the community uh, where I grew up, where I was born. So when I call, a lot of times she said, well, this is who died. You know, you get older, that's what you do, right? And I, I'm older, she's older. In fact, she's, uh, well, it's none of your business how old she is, right? So uh, she would say, well, uh, you know, this is who's passed away, this is who's passed away. And we got, we got to the end of our conversation. She said, well, if I think of anybody else, I'll call you. <laughs> I thought, well, Mom, don't, just don't do that. I thought if, if they've passed away and somebody in the family didn't think, you know who we should call? We should call Roy Mack and let him know. I said, if they didn't do that, I probably don't need to know. <laughs> so anyway, well, uh, again, happy Mother's Day, and we're going to get right on uh, into uh, our continuing our message series. If you are new to our church or have come as a uh, a mom or a mom who's brought a son or daughter, something like that, uh, don't worry, every message will stand alone by itself. Uh, they're just better if you know the rest of them, and uh, you're invited to come back to uh, watch them online, do anything that you would like to do with that if you find it at least um, appealing to you. So I, I, I meant to say also, uh, sometimes married guys forget about their, their wife that's a mother, Happy Mother's Day to my wife, April. She's been the epitome of a wonderful mother to my uh, four daughters and our, now our seven uh, grandchildren, so, of which we're all thankful for. All right, if you have your Bible with you, Isaiah 61 is where we're going to go just here shortly. And uh, as we set this up, we're going to be talking about this subject, that is the rapture of the church, or Jesus' second coming. How many of you got your paper with you? Imagine waking up to this one day. I hope you never wake up to this. If you wake up to this, you're in real trouble, all right? But uh, we'll talk about how to get out of trouble. Millions of people missing. Wow, what a, what a headline that that would be. Isaiah is an incredible book in the Old Testament, incredible prophet, uh, if, and this has been a series about prophecy. And so uh, you would... Not have uh, you'd have a lot of holes in your theology or in your understanding of prophecy if it were not for Isaiah. And so uh, Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, uh, God gave Isaiah where he would be born, exactly where he would be born, how he would be conceived, what line, what family line that he would uh, be coming in uh, out of out of David's family. And then, interestingly enough, God told Isaiah uh, of this coming Messiah, who would, you know, Messiah is a deliverer, that he would uh, be uh, punished, 
and pierced, and he would carry our guilt and our shame. And that's why Isaiah 53 starts out this way. Well, who would believe our report? What Isaiah is saying, God, if I say this, who would believe it? Uh, that's, that's what the Messiah is going to be. He's going to carry guilt and shame, and uh, he's going to uh, be wounded for our transgressions and striped for our healing and all. Who would believe that if I even said that? But 700 years before Jesus was born, all those things were given to Isaiah. Isaiah's name means salvation of the Lord. And the theme of the entire book, 66 chapters in Isaiah, it's called the Little Bible, just like there's 66 uh, books in your Bible, 27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old Testament, in 39 chapters of Isaiah, there's a, there's a new division that starts, and then the last 27, I mean, it's just a mirror uh, so much of the Bible, and who but God, we ought to put something together like that. So, in his theme being deliverance, he witnessed the, uh, the captivity uh, of, uh, or the, the besiegement of Jerusalem and Israel, uh, Israel being taken captive by the Syrian army, Judah, where, it, where Jerusalem is at, being taken captive, captive uh, by the Babylonian army. He witnessed the people, when the city was under siege, running to their housetops and crying out, Jehovah, save us. Literally the reference even to his own name, Jehovah, save us. The final deliverance that Isaiah deals with is the deliverance of creation from the bondage of sin's curse on the earth when Jesus returns, not this next time, but the even another time beyond that and sets up his kingdom and rule here uh, on the earth. So, so much of being a pastor uh, is to rightly divide the word of God. Uh, it's just important that you hear that. It's important to understand that because you can make the Bible read any way you want to. And that's what is very popular in our day. People just make it read any the way they want to. But there's a, there's a way uh, to always study the Bible. And one a handful of things just to keep in mind is always to teach it in context uh, you, you know think about the in context we we learned in the opening message that almost a third of the bible is prophetic so the pastor teacher missionary evangelist life group leader uh disciple uh disciple or disciple maker we need to be equipped to speak on prophecy and to rightly divide it in other words, to be able to answer the questions that, that um, many people in our day want to know about. And according to a nationwide survey, uh, number two on the list is we want to know about prophecy. We want to know about the, the, the end days. That's people in church, out of church. Even people out of church know it can't continue like it is. Something is going to happen. So someone asked Winston Churchill what qualifications are needed to succeed in politics. He said... I love Winston Churchill. He said, it's the ability to foretell what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year, and then the ability to explain why it didn't happen. Yeah. Right? And so many uh, of our modern-day prophets have to spend equal time talking about why things didn't happen the way they said it was going to happen. And, but you know what? The, the prophets in the Word of God, like Isaiah, they never had to get up and say, well, let me explain why it didn't happen this way or that way. In fact, one of the great phrases in the Bible is simply this, and it came to pass. Search that sometime in the Scripture. See how many times you see that, and it came to pass. God said, this is how it's going to be, and then it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. So I'd like us to, uh, to read the first two verses of Isaiah 61. If you'll notice with me here, imagine... Isaiah coming before the people, speaking for God, and saying these prophetic words, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And, and we're going to leave those verses up, guys, if y'all will, for just a second. Uh, 700 years later, Jesus goes into his hometown in Nazareth, goes into the synagogue. As he has just started his ministry, he is a, uh, he is a teacher. 
So uh, just a little bit of honor. He comes before his home crowd in his hometown in his home synagogue, and he asks for the scrolls of Isaiah, particularly Isaiah, what we would call Isaiah 61, to be brought to him. And imagine him now reading because the, according to, and don't, don't go there, guys, yet I'll get to it in a second, but Luke chapter 4 is where you'd find where this happens. Now imagine Jesus standing in his hometown before his home people saying, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Follow along now to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he stopped right there and closed the scroll. He didn't read the rest of it. He just stopped right there. Now then, Luke chapter 4, we're in that story, picking up in uh, verse 21, and he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he's saying what Isaiah said 700 years ago, I'm here to do. I'm here to do. And all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, isn't that Joseph's boy? Right? I mean, we don't, we don't quite get that, but isn't that Joseph's boy, the carpenter? Isn't, isn't that his boy? And he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to do all those, those things. Jesus was fulfilling what Isaiah said would happen. I'm here to do this right now. Today it's been fulfilled in your ears. I'm here to set the captives free. I'm here to preach the good news. I'm anointed of God to heal the brokenhearted. I'm here to do that. But watch now, but just the first part. What lies in the middle of verse 2 is my subject, his second coming or the rapture of the church. It wasn't time to do the other part, just the first part. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Isaiah couldn't tell the first coming from the second coming or the millennial, the millennial reign of Christ. When he looked at it, it all looked like one event as God gave it to him. And I gave the illustrations like driving out west. Many of you have done that. You go uh, into Denver and you see all the, the, the start, really, the Rocky Mountains. And all those mountains look like they're just stacked one on top of another. And then you realize when you get to the first one, it's miles to the next one, lots of miles to the next one. But at a distance, and that's how Isaiah saw these events, they were all stacked together. But in fact, there were many miles, or in our case, many years between one mountainous event and another mountain, uh, mountainous event. So, uh, so there's going to be a long valley between what Jesus was doing when he was here on the earth and when he would come back, we know it's at least 2,000 years. And then there's going to be a tribulation time. And then he returns again to set up his kingdom upon the earth. So there's space between all these things. So that is what we're going to talk about in part uh, is the, the, the first part and the second part of Isaiah's message here. Uh, in verse 2, the second part of it is, he says, the day of vengeance of our God. Well, make no mistake about this. Today is not the day of vengeance of our God. Now, there are signs of the times. As we're journeying between the mountains, we realize we're coming up on another mountain. We realize things be a-changing in our world, and they be a-changing rapidly. And something's got to give. Something has got to change. So you and I are living in a day of grace when we are invited to come to Christ and lay our burdens down. And it's the explanation of really the first part of Isaiah's message and the first part that Jesus read in his synagogue. This is a day he's come to, man, if you're brokenhearted today, you're in the right place. Jesus loves you. He wants to help you. He wants to bind up your broken heart. He wants to preach the good news to you. If you're in the captivity of your own sin today, listen, he wants to set you free. He's here to do all those things. This is, this is the ministry. This is a, of his. This is a day of grace. This is what we call the church age. The church given the mission and message of Jesus Christ. Uh, and listen, so today's pastors should be able to take on that same mantle and say it this way. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. 
And I'm here to proclaim the good news to you. Amen? I'm here to preach the, that we're going to set the captives free and so forth. So this is a day of salvation for you and your loved ones. And every weekend I get the privilege of preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures. And then we give what we call an invitation. You know what an invitation is? We're inviting you to put faith in what God's Word says by the Spirit of God speaking to you and the Word of God lining up and the Spirit of God saying to you, hey, what the preacher's saying is right and true and you need to believe this and put your faith in this. And so we're giving an invitation. Lots of churches don't give any kind of invitation. It makes me wonder what the point of the preaching was. Now, I realize there's some different methods out there. I'm not throwing stones at everybody, but listen, I, I, I'm, I'm preparing a message that I might invite you to put faith in it. And so an invitation uh, will be given. By the way, I love the invitation when you put it in the Bible language. We're going to give an invitation to come to the great banquet that he has prepared. There's a seat at the table for you. How wonderful it is. You ever had a, somebody have a party and you didn't get an invite? It makes you feel terrible, doesn't it? Well, he's thrown a party and he's giving you an invitation and he says, I've got a seat for you at my table. It's an invitation for you to come to him and lay down your religious practices and enter into what is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an invitation to come and dine at that table where there's a banner over you that, that as the scriptures say, that says is love. It's an invitation to be born again in the kingdom of heaven. And, and listen, we'll say, well, I was adopted. Well, the other end of that, he says, well, I'm going to adopt you into my family. It's a both and. You can be born again and it means the same thing or you can be adopted into the family. The same meaning uh, takes place. No differentiation uh, of any of it. It's an invitation for you to come from the hog pen in which you're living and come back to the waiting father that loves you desperately and when you come, he says, I want to run to you. How beautiful is that? He's just waiting for you to get sick of eating the husk with the hogs and make your way home. And he says, I'm going to run to you and I'm going to throw my robe upon you. I'm going to put my ring on your finger and shoes on your feet. And I'm going to tell him, kill the fatted calf because my son that was dead has come home. Man, it's wonderful to have an invitation. Each week I watch people as I preach. This still is the best sort of seat in the house though I stand. Thank God for those who have, in Jesus' words, ears to hear. Amen? You have ears to hear and hearts to believe and minds to understand, and it, and it, and it shows up on your faces, and it shows up in your actions, and I see people each and every week fall under conviction, and I see people make decisions. And it's wonderful to meet them in the other room. They said, Pastor, I was one of those that prayed today. Oh, my gosh, I've been looking for this for years. What a, what a burden has been rolled off of my shoulders in my life. And many of them I watch come back uh, each and every week, and I see the trajectory of their lives begin to change. I've been here nine winters now. I, I, I've seen some things in your lives. And many of you, you're not the people you used to be. Praise God for the Word of God that has helped mold you and shape you and change you. You're, you're different people. You're different kind of parents. You're different people. Thank God for that. But others of you, I, I, I watch each and every week, and you have no more interest in spiritual things than a stray dog is looking for a collar or a leash or a feral hog trying to find a butcher. And some of you right now is, man, I'm just here because Mama said come, and I, you know, come on, man. Come on, give me, a, give me a break, buddy. And I listen, however you're here, we're glad you're here. I mean that. I, if you just kind of make your mama happy, I'm, I'm glad that you're here, but I hope God will arrest your attention today. And, and maybe you're here to make your son happy or your daughter happy. Maybe you're the mother. I don't know. But I know this. God wants to say something to you. The Bible even concludes with this final invitation. As we're talking about an invitation. Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride says, come. And let those who hear say, come. And let uh, the one who is thirsty come. Let one who desires to take the water of life without price or freely. 
It's free. It costs him everything to offer you a free gift of salvation. The Spirit, that's the capital S, the Spirit of God is saying for you to come. As I preach, the Spirit of God is saying, come, come to Jesus. The, the, the bride is the church. The mission of the church is to say, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come and do it. My friends, let me tell you this for sure. There's an awful price to pay if you don't come to him. If you don't come to him. Revelation 22:20 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I come quickly. Meaning this, when he comes, there's not time for you then to get it worked out. When he comes, the door is shut and it's over and the day of invitation is over and the day of vengeance of our God has started. How quickly will he come? In Jesus' own words in Matthew 24, verse 27, and, and truthfully, this is really talking about the portion of his judgment, but in principle, it would be the same because he comes as a thief in the night, but he comes this way also, for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will it be the coming of the Son of Man be. Wow, as quick as a lightning strike, you tell me you're going to get your stuff together? I think I'll start living for Jesus in between the lightning strikes, so it's like, like lightning shining from the east to the west, and it's over. There's no time after that. When he comes, he's coming for his bride, the church, the church. Those who have given him their lives, not just their spare time and their spare change when it was convenient, but they've had their sins washed in his blood. We have been totally forgiven, and we know it because our lives have changed. He's coming for that person, those people. This event is called the rapture of the church. The word rapture is not a Bible word. It is an English word that we've ascribed to this event or this happening that we see in the Scripture. Rapture describes the intense excitement of seeing our beloved Savior and the immeasurable joy we'll have when we see Him. When we see Him. We used to sing songs in church as I was growing up. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. And some of us of a certain age, we, we sang pretty regular, the king is coming. It talked about the marketplace is empty. Millions are missing. That's why the marketplace is empty, right? I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. As quick as lightning, the trumpet sounds, and we see him. And we'd sing the midnight cry. In chapter 25, there's the parable of the ten virgins, and there you see these people who are unprepared. They didn't have oil in their lamp, but in the midnight hour, the bridegroom came, and there was a midnight cry that lifted up. When Jesus steps out and calls his children, and we'll be going home, but for those who are left behind, you've heard the phrase, there will be hell to pay. Our minds cannot comprehend the hell there will be to pay. This is, as Isaiah prophesied, the day of vengeance of our God. The start of the tribulation period on the earth. Again, if you believe something different about when the tribulation starts and when the rapture is, you get your own church and preach, and until then you can be wrong, okay? <laughs> you go with me. I realize there's some, uh, listen, I, I, I described all that a few weeks ago. It's not imperative that you believe the sequence of events. It's imperative that you put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation and him alone. Amen. I believe the word of God divides out this way. That when, the, when Jesus comes, there's the rapture and then the start of the tribulation period. I say this with brokenness to you. The headlines will read millions worldwide. Missing. I think on the other side, there'll be lists like this in every community. These are, these are people, we don't know what's happened to them. Have you seen this person? Then in the fine print, you know, it's people are mourning worldwide for their loved ones. The world markets will immediately crash. They're going to crash. Could aliens be involved? 
Well, you got to think of something if you're not going to believe the Bible. It has to be something like that, right? But there'll be a lot of people, a lot of people who came in and out of churches like this, and you'll remember messages like this that will haunt you. And I believe the biggest day of church attendance probably will be the day that millions are missing. And church buildings are going to fill up going, have you seen so and so? What in the world's happened? Could this have been the rapture? I'll talk more about that in the messages that, that will come. Man, can you imagine? Planes crashing, cars abandoned, people missing, the whole thing. People wandering about. Listen to Jesus' own words describing it. Matthew 24, we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew 24 in this series. He says in that day, listen, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Just boom, what happened to the guy? Two women will be working at the meal. One, one, one's taken and, and one's left. Watch therefore, if you do not know what hour the Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect when you least expect it. Expect it. <laughs> what if Jesus were truly coming this afternoon? I mean, what if he really was? This afternoon, how fortunate I'd say that you are that you're here, and this is maybe the last time that you would have to hear the gospel and to respond to an invitation. And maybe you don't know if you're prepared or not or you're uncertain about that. Well, you couldn't be in a better place because I want to be able to help you at the end. And I promise at the end of the service, we're going to give an invitation and describe what it is to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to know that when he comes, you can go with him. So what kind of day will Jesus come in? Uh, let me just pose that question on the floor uh, this morning. What kind of day uh, will it be? Let's listen again to Jesus' words in Matthew 24. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Let me just simply say it this. It was an ordinary day. The day that the rain started falling in Noah's day and judgment came, it was an ordinary day. Ordinary day. You remember the story. God had Noah preach and build an ark for 120 years. He preached 120 years it was going to rain. It had never rained on the earth. Don't you know that was a funny thing? Well, it's never rained before. Read it carefully in the scriptures. Dew just came up from the ground and watered the vegetation. It had never come a thunderstorm and rained. And so he's saying it's going to rain. That, that was as weird as the saying fire is going to fall from heaven in our day. Oh, Noah, what a buffoon. You're so stupid. Look at you building your boat. I bet you don't even have a permit. Right? Has the inspector come out and looked at it? No water around here, Noah, you big idiot. But after 120 years of grace and mercy, a day of grace, God put Noah in the boat, and the Bible says God shut the door, and when he shut the door, he opened a window of heaven, and the rain began to fall. What was that day like when God shut one door and opened the window to another? Is it a day like any other day that a day that Jesus said, a day like I'm going to come in? People will be at their cousin's wedding, out eating, goofing around at a ballpark, throwing a frisbee at, at, at the park, going to a show, going to their job. It's just a day like any other day. If you read the whole chapter, there's things that are out of sequence there. I'm going to describe why in a moment, but uh, you're talking about stars falling and it's like the earth is melting. That's not a day like any other day. Come on now, amen? That'd be a day that'd be memorable. But just any other day. That's a day like he says, I'm coming in. 
One of the tragedies of the modern church is that we've de-emphasized the coming of the Lord. I can remember as a kid when the pastor talked about the second coming, man, it made my heart skip a beat. It kind of wrecked me for a few days because I was unsaved for the, was the main reason of that. I have got up in the night and went in my mom and dad's bedroom to see if they were still here. You know what that is? That's conviction, man. I wonder if, they, I wonder if Jesus has come tonight. I knew that I had not been saved. I knew I needed to be. But we're just sleeping through the rumblings of the signs of the times. We're sleeping through it right now. We've been so de desensitized to it. When April and I first married, we lived in a, an apartment uh, that is, uh, my parents had a place called Pickles Gap. Doesn't that sound like a great spot? Pickles Gap, Pickles Gap Village. And they had a little apartment that uh, on one side of that property set about as far as the front row from, from me off of a dirt road. At the end of that dirt road was a warehouse. And every night at midnight, a big rig loaded up something, whatever they had down there, and it took off, and you could hear it going through the gears, and it sounded like it got through 10 gears before it got to our bedroom window. The first night that her and I were married, we were sleeping in that bed. I'm telling you, it came by. I thought it was coming through the house. Pictures fell off the wall. Stuff fell off the dresser. Her and I panicked, ran out of the bed, and up, up a little short flight of stairs. Our hearts are beating out of our chest. What in the world is that? And I thought, that, that's a truck that's going to about run through our, our building. Well, you know what? Every night it did that. Well, I'll tell you what we did. We, we took stuff off of the wall on that side, and we laid the pictures down. And after a few months, I never heard that truck again. It's truth. Same truck, doing the same thing at the same time. But I had got used to it, and now I could just sleep through it. And man, that's a picture, if there ever was, of the church today. As we wind up this for a few minutes, let me talk about the signs of the times. I'm going to make a few points under it, and you'll have this to go out with. One of the principles of studying the Bible is always asking, who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? What's the culture? What's the politics? What's the line of thinking? What does the other parts of the Bible have to say about the subject and so forth? Matthew 23 and Matthew 24 particularly is one of those places. Matthew 24, if you do not ask those questions and have that guidance, you're going to be about as messed up theologically as you could possibly be. In Matthew 23, Jesus has just laid a stripe. I mean a blistering stripe on the scribes and Pharisees and the, the, the Sadducees. I mean the religious leaders of his day. It's woe unto you, you bunch of snakes and vipers and man. Those guys wasn't being, they weren't used to being talked to like that. He blistered them. And then he goes out and weeps over the city. That's how the chapter 23 uh, uh, ends. Verse 37 and 38, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He just weeps over the city. Jerusalem, you're that city that kills my prophets like Isaiah. Everybody I send to you to warn you about what is going to happen and what's going to come. Here's what you do. You just go kill them. And obviously they're going to do that to him as well. And he weeps over the city. Oh, I wish like a chicken I could just gather you in and you would just follow me and believe me and love me, but you're going to be desolate again. You guys remember he was their Messiah and remember the, the parable of the, uh, the treasure found in the field, right? They're going to be scattered again. And he weeps in that situation. So chapter 24 starts out. Jesus has walked out with his disciples. His disciples are showing him the city as if he's never seen it. Let that soak in for a second. The sun is setting and the moon is rising and the, that temple was glistening and it was beautiful. And look at this city, Jesus. Look at this city. But he says, man, let me tell you something. There's not going to be one stone left on another. It's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to be thrown down. And boy, those guys, that just wrecked their world. They came to him in verse 3 privately with these kind of questions. When? Tell us when. What's going to be the sign? How are we going to know? I mean, it was very, very troubling. And so you need to, 
answer these things. In this passage, Jesus is the rejected Jewish Messiah, rejected by Jerusalem, its religious leaders. He's speaking to Galilean Jewish men, answering the question to them specifically about that temple and this destruction and all those sorts of things. So you have to get the line of thinking. Those buildings were the most precious things to those men that there could be. You and I have the benefit of history to look back through for some answers. First of all, Jesus never answered the when. And by the way, when I tell you why, I think you'll see the kindness in it because it was only going to be a handful of years. It's 70 A.D. There was a revolt. You can read this in your history book. There was a revolt. And the Jewish people rose up in Rome they sent uh, Vespasian, the general, sent his, his son Titus to that city, besieged it for a number of months, finally broke into the temple. They destroyed the temple, tore every stone off of itself except for the western wall, which stands today. That's what you visit, is the western wall. Everything else is thrown down. Historians tell us they crucified so many people in 70 A.D., the Romans crucified so many Jewish people they ran out of lumber. What enough trees to kill them all? Do you think it was kindness that Jesus, knowing that, didn't say, well, men, in 70 A.D., this is what's going to happen? I think it was kindness on his part that he did not talk to them about those things. For our study, if you're looking at chapter 24, the rapture fits between verses 7 and and verses 9, it is this. It's the beginning of sorrows. When Jesus comes for this earth, that's the beginning of sorrow on this earth. Rapture for me and you, if you know Jesus, sorrow for the earth. Three things. First of all, the state of the world. Y'all okay? Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. History has provided every age with someone who said they were a Messiah. Even in Jesus' day, there were people who said they were Messiahs and caused revolts. We Listen, you may not have heard of Jim Jones. If you're my age and older, you have. If you're my age and younger, you probably have not. But everybody has heard, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I don't have time to go through all that, but you can look up Jim Jones. Do you know why not to drink the Kool-Aid? Oh, he's a Messiah of sorts, the David Koresh's. The, uh, it's an endless thing. And maybe more important than just a person of, of our day, a false kind of Messiah. By the way, the Antichrist will be a false Messiah. But we have a false gospel. Because this is the thing. Satan is a counterfeiter. Everything God is doing, Satan wants to come along and counterfeit it. He, listen, there's a gospel that is truth, but now, listen, you can just believe your truth. Like, that's going to get you anywhere. Believe your truth. Follow your truth. Do your thing. By the way, to do your thing is to be a Satanist. That's what it means to be a Satanist, just do your own thing. Do You do you, boo, right? <laughs> Free will. Just, just help yourself with all of it. A false gospel in art in my lifetime has been, has been a prosperity gospel. Oh, you give, you sow, you sow your money, and then you just get all this blessing back. And I'm telling you, whole segments of our country in the West, Western world, Western hemisphere, mainly our country, have swallowed that nonsense. It's sick. You give because you love. You don't give to get. How would that go over with your mother today? Mom, I got you a gift, and, well, I'm just kind of wondering what you're doing for me now. <laughs> right? Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7, you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, and various or or in many places. The, the headlines of today are, are Russia and Ukraine, and even that we're kind of tone deaf to at the moment. But you realize that uh, 
much of the bread basket is in Ukraine and it's unharvestable wheat right now. There will be famines in the world by this time next year because of what's not going to be harvested in that part of the world. Inflation, those kinds of things, that, that, that's in itself a, a pestilence. Who would ever thought it'd take $100 to fill your tank up with gas? Pestilences, like COVID. And then it's still nations against nations and kingdoms rising up against kingdoms. And while we're focused on one part of the world, in places like Afghanistan, they're hunting down Christians and killing them because we've abandoned them there, by the way. Other parts of the world, the same way. The radical Islamic demonic terrorists have not gone away. They're regearing. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. There's always been pestilences somewhere along the way. There's always been earthquakes, but the whole idea is the increase. Since 1900, since 1900, 1 1.5 million earthquakes have been recorded from two on the Richter scale to eight. The state of the world is ripe for the coming of the Lord. But what about the state of the church? Second Timothy chapter three, the apostle Paul in his last letter, the last thing he ever said, writing to Timothy. But understand this, that in the what? Last days. There will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You can underline that one. There's not a greater mark in our day than that. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such... Avoid such people, for among whom those, those who creep into households, capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. And you may look at that and say, well, there's always been people that were disobedient, their parents and rebellious and loved money and prideful and so forth. Let me tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about the church. The church in the last days is that. How shocking that it is today that that is the condition of the church. I follow all the Christian news I can find in the world from places like Voices of Martyrs to the Christian Post to the Christian whatever. Every, every day, here is the, a sample of the headlines that I read daily. It's some whole church organization trying to decide if it's okay for a transgender person to be the pastor. Not to attend, not to be welcome, but to pastor the church. It's, is it okay for us to do this or to do that? And they're grappling over that. They're, they're, they're always trying to find the truth, but they're denying the power of it. They have a form of religion, but no power. No changed lives. They're just coming in and talking about book reports and talk, it's this and that and, uh, you know, they're left with nothing. If you don't speak the Bible in truth, you have nothing. There's no message there. If we're not going to preach the Bible, just y'all go and get out of here and eat, drink, be merry, and till you die. You come through the doors to hear the truth. Tell me that I think the world is desperate to hear the truth on these subjects. The headlines right now are very alarming. Hey, we're going to stop killing the babies. We've only, we've only aborted 62 million since Roe versus what? You think there's not going to be hell to pay for that? I say carefully and brokenheartedly, listen, there, there are women, women that I love in our church, and you have, you have that in your background. And let me just go ahead and tell all of you, thank God where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And there's forgiveness for all of it. God just wants you to open the closet, all the closets, and come to him. Remember the invitation? Come to him. Come to him. He will love you where you are. There's nothing you have done or you could do that would be outside of his love and forgiveness. Except 
not come to him. Accept that. What a horrible day we are living in. In Christianity, as verse 7, I think, or uh, verse 5 says, it's the appearance of godliness. Oh, we're here, but we, there's no power. Where's the power to change your life, to see different, to speak into the culture instead of the culture steamrolling you? The state of society, and I'm done. Jesus, help me. Romans 1. Boy, not many people turn to Romans 1 anymore. Let me tell you. Paul, you listen, there wasn't a more wicked place than where Paul wrote this and who he wrote it to. Rome was filled with sexual sins, all kinds of horrible stuff, things that would make us blush. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Come on, church. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Would to God we walked out of here and we were not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God. It's dynamite. That's literally what the word means. It's the dynamite of God. You throw a stick of dynamite and something, it changes things. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. For it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's how you and I are to live. I don't understand all, all of it. I don't either, but we're going to live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's what's happening in our day. We've got people suppressing the truth. God says this, well, I know, but, eh. well, don't say it. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he has have been made. The whole world has a witness of God. You can watch the sun come up and watch it set. You can see the seasons. You can see springtime and summer and fall and winter. You can go to the ant, look at the bee, study the human ear, study the eye, study the nervous system, study your own hand. At some point you go, there's got to be a God. But if you want to suppress the truth and believe whatever else, well, then now you got yourself a problem. His invisible attributes, right? They're clearly perceived. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And there is the problem. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Welcome to every university class. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Here's a key phrase. Therefore, God gave them up. You want to see what a world looks like without God? Let me show you. I'll give you up. I'll give you up to the lust of your own heart and impurity, to the disarming of your own bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You're going to take my truth, exchange it, and just believe a lie? And you can worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen? Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. If you're having trouble understanding that, it's not natural for two women to get in bed together. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. That's when oftentimes you're talking to someone about these kind of particular sins. It's like they can't see it, don't understand it, and think you're a buffoon. Oh, you're so narrow. Their, their minds are debased. To do what ought not to be done, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, for they were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. 
though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. You know how this goes. That used to shock us. Then we tolerated it. And now what was tolerated then becomes accepted, and that which is accepted now becomes celebrated and now applauded. Uh, th just to be honest, this is not in season right now. Every pastor in America right now that really believes the book, all of us have pressure to be a little easy in this area. And I'll tell you, I want everybody to love me and like me. I don't want you to hate on me. But this is not in season right now. 20 years ago, you preached this, man, oh, amen. Preach it, preacher. Now it gets quiet, and it's okay. Let me tell you why it gets quiet. Because every one of us, including myself, have people that we love and care about that are off in the deep end of this stuff. And we love them. And we go talk to them. And sometimes you will come talk to me, and they say, well, they're living in this kind of lifestyle, or they're transgender, or they're this and that, but they love Jesus. Let me help you with this. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll keep my word. And I'm telling you, we're in a delusion right now that all of this stuff is okay. Now, let me get to the other end of it. We got other people who come in, and, and listen, they go, well, I'm not that. No, but you're an adulterer and a fornicator and a gossip and a backbiter, and you love pleasure more than you love God, and you're so full of sin yourself. Be easy now. So whatever camp you're in, I'm not trying to throw stones and single you out. I'm telling you, we're all sinners. And except we come to him and open up the proverbial closet, all of our closets, and give him all of our mess, we're going to be living in that darkness. And I know, listen, I know because I talk to people like this. Well, you're judging me. No, friend, I'm not judging you. I love you. I love you enough to tell the truth. Well, you ought to alter the truth about that. It's not my truth to alter. It's God's truth. I, listen, if we're, if we're going to be with him in 30 minutes, <laughs> I want to know I did my best to tell the truth. The most famous, the most famous conversation in the Bible is, is Jesus and Nicodemus. And oftentimes we bail out at John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we just leave it right there. But listen, verse 17 and, and further is, is, so, is such a blessing too. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Oh, you're judging me. You're condemning me. Jesus didn't come to condemn you, but in order that the world might be saved through him, he's come. Whoever, whosoever, anybody, anybody who believes in him is not condemned, but whosoever does not believe in him, what's it say? You're condemned already. You were condemned before he got here. You were condemned before I said anything to you. You're living in condemnation, and here's why. Listen, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the judgment that light, that's him, he came into the world, and people love darkness more than they love the light. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem. I love my sin. I, I defend my sin. I'm going to keep my sin. Well, understand, it's not you keeping your sin. It's your sin's going to keep you. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. You flick on the light, man, and it's like, oh, I see. <laughs> That's what preaching is. It's a searchlight for God. Bang. <laughs> He's not searching you out to expose you. He's searching you out to rescue you. It's a lighthouse. Man, you're out there flailing and Oh, pastor, I'm having a good time. Will you think about it then? Wow. Listen, he's coming. We'll just sum it up this way. You staying or going? Amen? You staying or going? Oh, man, I want to go. 
There's nothing on this world, and there's no label it however you want to, <laughs> well, well, that I would want to hold on to and not be leaving when he's coming and face the day of vengeance of our God, the beginning of sorrows. Listen, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let me say to those of you who, listen, we have plenty of people who struggle with these things here in our own church. They were here last night, they're here today. Nothing here has been said out of a heart that is mean-spirited, but one that's caring. I just carry enough for you to tell you the truth. And if you know me well, you know that's exactly how I feel. As God turns a searchlight on in your heart, please come to him. Come to him. Just lay your life down. Say, well, Pastor, I don't know how to fix all that. You, you don't have to worry about fixing it. You just give it to Him. Give it to Him. You give Him your life. Give Him your heart. And you can't imagine how in short order He'll begin to put your life back together and give you a measurable joy. Some of you, hey, I've just come in to make Mama happy. I know that. You've not been interested. What a live Satan as if God is going to make you a monk or something. He wants to save you, give you a life so rich and so joyous you can't even begin to imagine it. He just wants you. Salvation is found in calling on the name of the Lord. It's pleading out of your sin like a drowning man. I don't want to drown. I want to be saved. Calling on the name of the Lord he says, who shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling is confessing in prayer what you know to be true, knowing that God loves you, knowing that Jesus has died for you, knowing that you're a sinner, not willing to hold on to your sin. That's like, that's like drowning and say, throw me a concrete block. No, I want the life preserver, please. If you'd like to receive Christ today, right where you sit, if the Spirit of God is saying, hey, the pastor's telling you the truth, just come into agreement with that and pray right out of your heart a prayer of salvation, asking him to be your Savior, asking him to forgive you for your sins. If you need help wording a prayer like that, pray like this. You can pray it right behind me. You don't have to pray out loud, but if you want to, it's fine. But right out of your heart, pray like this, dear God. Just right behind me like that. Dear God, I do believe that you love me. And I confess I'm a sinner. I see my sin and you see my sin but I believe that you Jesus died for me on the cross and when you come I want to go with you I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins I'm asking you to be my savior I'm asking it by faith and I'm asking it in Jesus name